Hello, everyone, and um, welcome uh, to the Unity Center. Hello, Shelby. And coming out tonight to hear uh, Victor Grossman uh, speak on socialism, East Germany, and many of the dynamics that went uh, into what happened there and his experience uh, and his unique perspective. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have um, John Wojcik to introduce Victor. Uh, John is uh, the editor of the People's World, and he's had a long relationship with Victor Grossman also. So, John. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Shelby. You know, uh, Victor is, and I'm really proud to be doing this here, and, you know, I don't care. We have a small group. It's still such an important discussion, and everybody can take this discussion wherever they, you know, wherever they have any kind of connections or influence. Victor is a long-time correspondent for the people's world, and he really deserves a, a, an applause and, and thanks because the years that he's been doing this, writing articles for us, sometimes weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, depending on the schedule, he has never charged us a penny, and, and we've had, like, you know, first-hand coverage of events in Europe from him. So that's how we got to know him through People's World as a correspondent. But Victor is uh, just back here. He's here from a, this is a stop for him on a national tour that's incredible. It started in April in Massachusetts, and it ends in July in New York City, and, and literally every place in between. College campuses like Amherst and Harvard, uh, public meetings at the headquarters of magazines, publications, museums, the Benton Museum, bookstores, Crockton Eagle Library in San Francisco, the Red Building in Los Angeles, uh, every, literally, you know, 15 different, 16 different states, cities all over the place. And at his young, dynamic age, he <laughs> has been really held up incredibly you know, with the store. So we will have, uh, also, he's a weak person because, you know, he's been in the Communist Party how many years? Uh, 1945. 1945, he joined the Communist Party in the United States. But yet he was drafted. I mean, you know, he worked. He's a graduate of Harvard University, but an organizer of steel workers in Buffalo after he got out of Harvard. He was drafted into the Army, served in the U.S. Army, had to flee because of the McCarthy era. They were rounding up communists in the U.S. Army. That was in Germany. Uh, he spent an entire career at the GDR, raised a family there, everything else, and he's come out with this incredible book. And the reason I'm going to, one more sentence that I just want to tell you. The thing about this book, you know, there's a lot of debate. Is it worthwhile looking back at what happened in the socialist countries? This book is not just looking back at what happened in the socialist countries. It's taken that knowledge and applying it to where we are today and where we have to go, you know, in the future. So I think you'll really enjoy it. If you want a copy, he can autograph it. Victor, I'm going to turn it over to you. So, hello again. I should first mention that, uh, first of all, that I grew up in a very left-wing environment in a very left-wing time in the late 30s when my hometown, New York, but also the whole country was more, far more left than we've known it since. And uh, my family was too. And I was impressed by fights in those days, building of the CIO. Some of you know about the GM strike in Flint. I, my first, the first newsreel I can remember was seeing the guys leaning out the window, uh, triumphing, triumphant that they had won that, that strike. The fight to save the Scottsboro boys, which was a fight led by the party. The fight, especially to save Madrid and to save Spain, which was also led, as you um, should know and probably know, was supported only by two countries, Soviet Union and Mexico, United King, uh, uh, Britain, France, and unfortunately the United States as well, supported basically Franco and Hitler and Mussolini. This impressed me and this is what helped me shape me as a, as a red. <coughs> and when I got to Harvard, I, well, I should say, at high school already, I was recruited into the Young Communist League, and its follow-up organization was the American Youth for Democracy, and that 
with that, I arrived at Harvard <coughs> and found another fellow from the AYD who was from Chicago. Uh, he was here, he was uh, active with the Farm Equipment Union in those days, which was also a left-wing union. And one day we, we were trying to build a, a youth club there. One day he came to me with a piece of paper like this and said, you're a red, aren't you? I said, yeah, sure, why? He said, sign, then sign this. What is it? Application for membership in the Communist Party. And my head started, and my head started at thoughts. First of all, do you have to be a member? And the second thought was, uh, gee, if I sign this, what could this mean for my future career? Because it, that was 1945. The Second World War, War wasn't over yet, but the Cold War had already begun. So it was not good to be a leftist already. So that we, we founded a communist group at Harvard, but we didn't publicize it as communists. We were, we were really secret as a communist party, but we were very active in, in this AYD and in several fights. We fought on Jim Crow. We fought on in the Steelworkers Union to try to prevent it from going further right. We supported a, a big a picket line in, in Boston because a big department store was hiring only whites. And so, we, and in other ways, we were very active. After 45, the party said, our party is a party of the working class, but we don't have enough working class members at present. Would any of you, even with your diplomas at Harvard, maybe think of going into, into work, in, in factory work? I was one of the three who said yes. I, I got to, first to Syracuse where I couldn't get a job, then to Buffalo where I did get a job and got to know what was new to me then from a middle class intellectual family. I got to know working class people with all the good and the bad sides to that. My colleagues were pretty conservative, were all of them racist, were, uh, um, well, they were, I don't know if they were anti Semitic or not, but. And one thing I did learn was I've met face to face what we call class conflict. It was a daily fight between the working guys and the and the company through their foreman of pennies, basically of, of fighting out a little more one way or the other. Sometimes the uh, the company was always trying to cheat us in in any way possible. By the way, that was a an important factory. They were the first ones to make these uh, air conditioners, uh, uh, room air conditioners, Fetters Quiggin, but we didn't even have uh, a proper um, washing facilities or even uh, lockers and, and no food. Uh, you had to go to the greasy spoon next door to get a meal. In any case, I was involved in a, a contract fight, which almost turned into a real fight, but then the the head of the the heads of the union there were corrupt and they calmed it down in any case after a year oh but most important for me in that period in buffalo was i got to know this amazing amazing family which became my home away from home that was the the lumpkin family uh, you know <laughs> uh, i think most of you know or know about b yeah i didn't know b so well but i knew her husband very well and all of his eight his nine siblings because it was a family had hattie was a mother and she was a fighter like i've rarely seen uh, i still remember how she passed in the street somebody whose furniture was being taken out because they couldn't pay the rent she got her kids to go get all the neighbors and she got a whole bunch of neighbors and they put them back in and uh, she was a terrific fighter and helped me too and then as i say all her uh, almost all of her kid, uh, 10 kids, one was a little too old and one was a little too young then, but eight of them plus their spouses were the basis of the, of the communist community in Bu Buffalo. That was the heart of it. And this meant an awful lot to me. Also selling the Sunday worker in, the, in, in a, um, an area in, Bu in Buffalo. It was the, uh, one of these new projects in the, in the ghetto and I didn't dare to go into the white areas, frankly, because there I could have got my face bashed in or reported to the FBI. That's okay, leave it, leave it, leave it. Um, but there I went around 
perhaps I can tell you a, a little. I went around every Sunday selling papers through the prospect, uh, through the project. It was all black families. As opposed to the white areas, no, none of the families was one exception. None were hostile to me. They weren't so anti-communist. At the same time, they weren't particularly interested. Uh, the paper may not have been so interesting to them, and they had worries of their own. Except one family was really interested and, and got to talking with me. It, was, it really made me feel good. And when I came back second and third Sunday, they also were ch talked about politics and so forth. And on the third week, however, they, they invited me in for uh, coffee or tea, and we got chattering, and they said, you know, we have a publication too. That might be interesting to you. What was it? It was the Seventh, uh, seventh Day Advent <laughs> people. <laughs> they, they tried to sell me on. <laughs> and there was another family, a woman, and she was she seemed interested too. But when I went in, she told me this very sad story of all the troubles she was having with the children and everything. And in the end, I lent her five dollars. So I came out poorer than I went in. And when I went back a week later to maybe to get it back, she had an even sadder story. What I figure is she was saying, this white kid must be good for some damn thing. You know? and, uh, however, it taught me an awful lot. But then I got drafted and I, I signed this statement that I had never been in a left wing organization out of fear. Because, it, because if you didn't register as a, as a leftist, from one of the communist front organizations, you could be sentenced to, for every day you didn't register by the police, five years. In other words, after a week, it's 35 years. After two weeks, 70 years. And out of fear, I signed that I had never been in anything, hoping that for two years, if I kept my mouth shut, they wouldn't check up on me. I was lucky I was not sent to Korea. I was sent to West Germany, but they did check up on me. Possibly, I'm not, I don't really know why, uh, because they knew all the organizations I had been in and named six of them, Spanish Refugee Appeal, Southern Negro Youth Congress, and others. They didn't mention the Communist Party. I think they didn't want to expose their spies in there. But years later, Freedom of Information Act, I got 1,100 pages about me from the FBI and the Army, about me, just me, including this one. Here's a copy. <laughs> You can take a, take a look at it. In fact, I can pass one around. Uh, no, I can't pass this around, another one. But it says in here, somebody, his name is, is redacted. Somebody said that I had been a radical and a leftist, probably a communist while at Harvard. Must have, another student wrote this about me. Maybe that's why they checked up. In any case, for having lied, as I did, five years, up to five years and 10,000 possible. So I said, not for me, I'm not gonna spend five years in a military jail. In addition, that law, the McCarran Act, which was later ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, but it also provided in case of emergency for concentration camps for people like me. I figured without me, and that's when I decided to, to, to defect. That's when I swam across the Danube River from the American zone to the Soviet zone, and the Soviets brought me to East Germany. That's how I landed there to the German Democratic Republic in 1952. So um, when I was there, uh, I'll just tell you briefly that I, I was first sent to a town where the Soviets sent all West, deserters from Western armies. There were, there's always sort of a trickle. There were about 30 or 40 of us from, um, uh, some were from the US, some from Britain, from France, one group were Moroccans and an Algerian who didn't want to serve in the French army against Vietnam, and they had deserted. Five of them were uh, African-Americans who, in at least three or four cases, had teamed up with, uh, with German women. And this, in those days, was, was still disapproved. And in one case, at least, the guy was told, if, um, unless you break off, we're gonna send you to Korea. Instead of Korea, he came to the GDR. In any case, uh, after a year there, when I worked in a factory and could compare factory conditions, East and US and GDR, they set up a school for us deserters to learn a trade. And I learned to uh, run a lathe machine. Uh, amazing for me, because I've always been a technical idiot. 
but somehow I learned it. And, uh, but I never worked at it because luckily for me then, I was able to get, uh, to get uh, okay on studying at this Karl Marx University in Leipzig. And this is, makes me the only person in the world to have a diploma from Harvard University and a Karl Marx University in Leipzig. And, <laughs> but I'm afraid I'm gonna stay the only one because unfortunately it's no longer called the Karl Marx University. Since unification, they dropped that name. But so I'll be the only one. Uh, in any case, I studied there four days. I had great luck that in that first town I was in, I met my future wife, which meant, which saved me from, mostly from homesickness and loneliness. Uh, I, I was very, very lucky to have this wife who I, for over 50 years before she died, uh, and two sons we had. So what did I see in the GDR? Um, the first year was a tough year there. I should mention, I don't know if you know it, but first of all, the GDR is much smaller than West Germany. It was much smaller than West Germany. It was almost free, had no natural resources. West Germany had plenty. We had in the East only low grade cheap coal, which are called lignite. It's hardly coal, it's almost half wood. And, uh, and it's stinky and it takes a lot of processing to, to use it but it's all they had. They had that in great, great quantity, but that's all they had. And um, uh, not only that, but they paid reparations, whereas West Germany paid almost no reparations. East Germany paid over, well over 90% because the Soviets and Poland had been so completely destroyed in the war that they needed desperately to catch up and to, to rebuild their economy, they needed this and took it from East Germany, whereas the Western companies didn't need it so much and said to West Germany, you don't have to pay anymore, partly because already by 1947, if not earlier, the United States and the West generally realized this West Germany is too important to keep down. They've got a big, big important industry, even though a lot of it was wrecked, it's still there and the skills are there and the resources are there we're gonna build this up as a base against the East. And we in the East had very little, no Marshall Plan on the contrary, no resources. Not only that, a, a good part of the management, which is so necessary in a factory or an enterprise, had been pro-Nazi. And when they saw the Soviets coming and German communists coming to East Germany, they took off for the West. And, and this is one of the main differences between East and West Germany at that time from the East Germany, even before the GDR was formed, they threw out and confiscated all of the big war criminal companies like Bayer, BASF, Siemens, Deutsche Bank, uh, Krupp, Tyson, which had made billions on slave labor in during the war, which had built up Hitler, most of them. They were the really guilty criminals in the world and they all came back to power in West Germany. In the first year or two, some of them were sentenced to prison, only a very few, a small number, but they got out by 1950 because now the idea of the United States was build West Germany up to oppose the East. Uh, but that meant, of course, we had in the East very few people with management uh, uh, skills. And even it was even tough to try and train a new uh, generation because a lot of them, <clears throat> A lot of the professors had also been Nazis and taken off for the for the uh, West. <clears throat> Excuse me. And despite having really all the cards stacked against the GDR, I watched after the first tough year, 52, 53, where, by the way, I saw nobody, as I sort of expected to see a lot of people hungry and and and, and rag. Nobody was hungry, but things were pretty tight. In the, in the stores, <clears throat> you could get enough to eat and to get dressed and so forth, but there went, but not an awful lot. <clears throat> After 1953, you could see it going up and up and up. The Soviets stopped taking reparations out and the industry was gradually built up. One interesting aspect, because it was bad planned, they went to the poorest area of all Germany. It was really almost feudal 
with big, big land estates and, and agricultural laborers and very, very poor farmers, if they were. And they divided, they divided up all estates over 100 hectares. I don't know exactly how many acres that is. Divided it up <clears throat> and gave it to the small farmers and laborers and people who are coming in as refugees from the east. Um, but especially they threw out these big shots, these big, huge war criminals and built up. And because they didn't have to pay millions in profit, these guys who had been taking profit out of the industry were no longer take, getting their profits. This made it possible to build up a social system, which was for me as an American, absolutely amazing. For example, when my, when my wife had a baby, First of all, the, the ambulance, the, the training in advance, which is voluntary, but how to, have a, how to have a baby relatively as painlessly as possible and how to take care of a baby. She had courses in this, the delivery and the time in the hospital then until she could get out was all free. Plus, in those days it was 500 marks. Later, when the economy went up, a thousand marks was given to every new mother on a following basis, which was very interesting. Five installments. The first two installments, if the woman went to the doctor to have a prenatal investigation to see if the baby was developing okay. The main installment when the baby was born, the fourth and fifth installment, if she went with a baby to have checkup, to have a checkup and a health checkup, uh, which was an incentive because a lot of women, as I was told, they go the first time, by the first baby, but with the second and third, we know all that. This time was an incentive to really go in for a checkup. Uh, in addition, she got at that time 14 weeks off for, paid to have the baby, uh, six before and eight after, but of course you couldn't always <laughs> you know exactly when it was coming, but 14 weeks later extended when the economy rose to six months, paid for every baby and an additional six months not paid, but with your job guaranteed. So you couldn't lose a job. And if you had a larger family, it was increased for three kids or more, it was increased to a year and a half. Um, when, she, when the baby uh, grew up, uh, by the way, I should mention, there was a bonus if, if, the, if the mother nursed the baby for six months, it was a bonus. The nurseries were free, kindergarten was free, Schools, of course, were free. College was free. Even advanced uh, graduate education <clears throat> was also free. And not only free, but you got uh, it averaged out later to 200 a month, which covered all basic extents, uh, expenses. In other words, food and board, and a little bit extra to visit your family at with Christmas, perhaps, or in the summer. Um, I, got th I got 300 because I was a foreign student. But um, otherwise, Everyone got enough to get by in college, college, which meant that I, in four years, never knew one of my cl classmates at college to work so along with studies. Nobody worked. If they want, maybe in the summer vacation, but otherwise nobody worked. And you were guaranteed a job in your trade when you graduated, which meant that nobody was scared about what would happen afterwards and have to serve tables, et cetera. Um, uh, I should add, not so many people were taken to college. They were more choosier with college because they never took more than they expected four years later to be able to give a job to. And there was also one rule, you were obliged if demanded that you spend the first three years after graduation where they sent you in your trade. And this was usually used for, for medical students were sent to rural areas where there are too few doctors in the hopes that maybe they'd settle there and, and improve the rate of doctors. Um, that was a, the medical side was, a, by the way, as I say, all medical and, and dental care was free. Um, I had hepatitis. I was in hospital for nine weeks. When I got out, I got four weeks recuperation at a beautiful, beautiful uh, estate which had been taken away from the Siemens company and uh, where we got all the massages and bubble baths and mud baths and whatever was considered necessary. 
uh, mostly in the morning and the afternoon you had pretty free and then evening it was some kind of entertainment usually organized by ourselves but that was four weeks also all of it free including transportation and 90 percent of my wages uh and a year later to make sure that i didn't have any uh, uh liver damage another four weeks this time in czechoslovakia at Carlsbad, a famous spa. Also, everything paid and 90% of my wages. My wife had three such cures for rheumatism at different at, over the years. One of them in, in Poland in the mountains and one in our own mountains. Uh, and as I say, this was all taken, you paid 10% of your wages up to a maximum of 60 marks a month, which was really nothing. Uh, and, and everything was covered. Uh, add to that that the rent was uh, the rate of how much you paid for rent. And people in Germany, many more live in rented apartments than in private homes. The rent was, the level was kept from 1945 on absolutely uh, the same. They never raised the rent late. It meant that for me, we got, I got, we, first we were sublet because they, they didn't have enough housing at first. The big housing development came later. But so we would sublet first uh, alone, then together as when we were married. Then when we had a son, we got also sublet, but a bigger, uh, we got one room and two rooms and kitchen use. And then, um, and then we got an apartment. I paid 114 marks a month uh, rent. I was earning at that time about 900 so that it was not much. It was not much, and that was an expensive apartment, but I was also getting a little more than average pay. This 114 marks I paid every month lasted until 1990, from 1961, with no increases. Uh, this was incredibly cheap. Of course, it also meant that private house owners did not have much money to fix up the outsides of the buildings, and they tended to look shabby often. Inside, people fix it up for themselves very nicely. Well, some had good good taste and some had not so good taste, but they were always a comfortable and good furnishing. When you went into these even shabby looking buildings in Berlin, you go into the apartments and they look very nice. And not only that, but about half the population uh, of the city population had a, a cottage or a bungalow someplace in, in, uh, on a lake shore if they were lucky or not too far away. And uh, this they paid very little for, and this is where they went in warm weekends and then in summer, if they didn't go off on vacation some other place, because you could get through your factory, you'd get a three week, no, a two week, was it two or three week vacation, I forget, but for 30 marks, which was nothing, it was just like that. Everything covered transportation, food, lodging. At, at, at the beginning, you had to bring your own uh, sheets and towels. Later, they, that was not necessary. Uh, this was not, uh, they, they, they rotated with this. You didn't get, uh, everybody wanted to go to the beach. That wasn't possible, but you got usually either the lake or the mountains or the beach. These were, uh, and one other thing I should mention about the, the, the rent was so low that almost everybody could pay it without difficulties, but you have some people who even then don't pay their rent and, or, or didn't want to pay the rent. You had people who even when they got warnings, you're not paying your rent, they couldn't be thrown out because there was a law against evictions. Nobody could be evicted. If you didn't pay your rent long enough, they could put you out, but not until they found another apartment to put you into. A, a cheaper one, of course, and a not as good a one, but nobody was thrown out on the street. That, so that in 38 years, I never saw a single soul sleeping in the street or in the park and never saw a beggar. And these were really wonderful accomplishments for people, um, which uh, as gradually the economy developed, there was more and more to, to buy, uh, more and more variety. Everybody, I think just about everybody lived comfortably. The, uh, some groups, especially some uh, pensioners who had not who had not had very good had only low paying jobs. Also, the, those were usually widows from the war who had never learned a trade and did house cleaning and things like that, which didn't pay well. But uh, but they got they got a pension, and they got everybody in the whole country by rule 
was entitled to a hot meal at lunch, and that's the main meal in Germany. So that you got it at your factory, you got a hot meal, or at school, or at college, or wherever you are, you got a hot meal for almost nothing. It was a very, very small sum, supported by the unions. So another, uh, this was a social aspect. Another aspect which was important to me, they not only threw all these big Nazi companies out, they threw the Nazis out. This meant that the schools were, which had been mostly, the teachers were mostly Nazis, about 70, 80, 90%, all cleaned out. Uh, the Nazis were thrown out of the schools. There was the Nazi judges, which was almost all of them, and prosecutors thrown out. The, in all spheres of, of administration, in the colleges, in, uh, in, in every field, the Nazis were thrown out. This means that not every, well, all of them were thrown out from the schools, if possible. A few slipped through, but um, not every Nazi was thrown out of a job because an awful lot had been. Uh, if they had not committed any nasty crimes or anything, they were able to integrate, reintegrate into the economy and, and eventually to hold jobs in lower levels uh, of administration and, and the town or council or such. But the top level, the, the, the Politburo, which was a government basically, it, there was a government uh, a, a regular state government, but the main ruling was by, this, by the party, which was uh, the Communist Party and the Social Democratic Party joined after 1945, but only in East Germany. West Germany, that was prevented. In East Germany, they combined. And before long, the Communist Party, though smaller in number, but also with the help of the Soviets, became the dominant factor. Uh, some of the Social Democrats were very satisfied with this, like my father-in-law. Some were angry at this and kept ties with the West, uh, where the Social Democrats were very anti-communist. Uh, this made for trouble. And it meant, and not only that, but you had a whole population who were, after the Hitler years, they were sick of Hitler because he had caused so much death and destruction, but they were against any kind of ideology an awful lot. And here, a relatively small number of communists, with the help in the first years of the Soviets, had to try and change the whole society. It was not easy, and it was and sometimes unpleasant because the newspapers were one line only. There was really no open discussion of political things because they were afraid that the West was always trying to take over again, was always trying to, uh, they, they demanded that we would take over again. This uh, made many people unhappy. That's why they never won over everybody. Uh, I would say, I estimated that you had about 15, 20% who are really devoted fighters for socialism. You had about 15 or 20% who are fiery against socialism. That means for capitalism and sometimes for fascism. And the ones in the middle, the large group, vacillated. If things went better, they were more pro. If things went worse, because we had ups and downs all the time, then they tended in the right. You couldn't generalize, each person is different. But that was a general trend. Uh, it was a constant fight there to win over people, especially young people. Sometimes it succeeded very well. The youth movement had a terrific solidarity campaign. The whole GDR, this is what I love too most about it also. The G Whereas West Germany supported Franco in Spain for years and years and years till he, till he died. The GDR was for the underground, for the anti-Frank. The, in Chile, the GDR supported Allende as long as they could. Pinochet, the fascist, were supported by West Germany. The GDR supported North Vietnam with Ho Chi Minh. West Germany supported the American uh, war against the Vietnamese. And most interesting, in Southern Africa, especially South Africa and what later became Namibia and Angola, the GDR supported them with very many uh, methods, published their newspaper, and did everything they could to help. 
West Germany supported apartheid with, with weapons and the rest of selling them, not giving them, but selling them weapons. Uh, this made for all kinds of contradictions. And, uh, oh, one other point I should mention. I mentioned that the big companies built themselves up again in West Germany. Not only that, but what's hardly known in the United States, as soon as the very top, most best known Nazis, some of them are hung, some of them are jailed, though not usually not all too long. A lot of them escaped to South America or, or some of them to Washington. But at the, above that top le thin level, the Nazis basically took over in West Germany. Uh, they ruled the roost. And here I worked for a little newspaper, a bulletin, which told that story, among others, in, in, in English. And this was our, this was our expose in one field alone in diplomacy, the diplomats, we we found, well, we made a map, or we had a map made by an artist with on every country where the ambassador of West Germany had been a member of the Nazi party, we put a swastika. And this is what it looks like. I'll, here, I'll pass it around. You can take a look at it if you, if, if, if you want. Uh, there were so many swastikas on here, it was very embarrassing for the West German government. The, the ambassador to the United States and to Britain had to be thrown out. And we had especially dirty about one ambassador as a young diplomat in, uh, during the war. He was not an ambassador yet. He had reported to Berlin in Holland, one third of the Jewish population has already gotten rid of. He boasted to Berlin. And this... SOB was now ambassador to Switzerland, but it created such a fuss, his, his, this such job that he had to be withdrawn from Switzerland and he was then appointed ambassador to Argentina, which was a, where he was okay because they were fascists there too. And, and this was the story all around, as I say, not all of them had been very nasty Nazis. Some had just joined to be for their career but some were really vicious types, and they ruled the government of the of the one the second cabinet. I don't know about the first one, but it was similar. Second cabinet of the twenty one cabinet ministers in the government, ten had been members of the Nazi Party, uh, eleven had been officers in the Nazi army, and the rest had various jobs too. Most of them, if not such jobs, this was true in in. In the universities and the newspapers, the judges were the same judges who had been condemning people for opposing Hitler. It was the same bunch of prosecutors. It was the, uh, on, in the teachers, an awful lot of the teachers were still Nazis. I just spoke with a young woman on my trip with one who went to school there and she told, um, she told how being anti-Nazi got her in trouble with her teacher. Uh, in the GDR, it was just the opposite. And our best books, our best uh, theater, our best um, films were anti-Nazi films. Some of them really wonderful films, which were never seen in, in the West. They were boycotted in the West. So why did all this go down the drain is the big question. Uh, basically, because those big, big shots in the West, these big companies never gave up their hopes of retaking what they had lost in the East not only the factories that they had lost and the banks, but the chance to expand was blocked by the GDR there. They couldn't move eastward. Uh, and they had to be careful, for example, not to engage militarily because the GDR said German soldiers should never be sent outside the country ever again. With Hitler was enough, no German soldiers outside our borders. Because of that, that West Germany couldn't really do any other uh, change that either without looking very bad. So that there, there were no German soldiers outside of Germany until unification, 1990. Very soon after that, you had German warplanes throwing bombs in Sir Serbia. And, and after that, you, had, uh, you, you didn't have soldiers in Iraq because the op opposition to that in Germany, to, was so strong that the candidate for uh, the leader, 
didn't dare to support the war in Iraq. He, he helped a little secretly, but never could send troops. But then when Afghanistan came along, Germany sent troops to Afghanistan. When fighting began in Mali, they sent troops to Mali and to other places. So, so this was meant that the barrier which the GDR represented was gone. And um, how did it happen? I'll try not to talk too long. I've already talked too long. Uh, was that people in the GDR, some of them were angry at this lack of controversy, this lack of discussion, the fact that, this, that the newspapers were, had only one direction and no other. And it was not only one direction, it was often boring, dogmatic, full of cliches, uninteresting. T people tended with the newspapers to look at the first uh, headlines on the front page and then to turn to the back for the sports, which were not, <laughs> and then look at the obituaries to see any of their friends were gone. And, and that was about it. And then in the news on the TV, radio and TV, they often just turned it off. Or they, or they turned into Western TV, which was full of lies and constantly telling us how terrible we had it in the East and very cleverly, but it was much more cleverly done. They learned from Goebbels with his techniques of lying, and they learned from Madison Avenue here how to sell things. First, they sold tooth, better toothpaste, then a better candidate, and then our system. And this worked because they'd show, even though they were sell, selling um, some kind of good candy or, or cars, which people envied. They, most people have the kind of car I drove in today, a Travi, a Trabant. Uh, that was the main car that people owned. If they had more money, they bought the next highest, which was Watt for. But that was the only two makes we had there. If you were very, had even more money, you might get some East European cars or and, uh, uh, some of the Western cars too, but very rare and it cost an awful lot. People saw the ads for Opals and for VWs and for Renaults and for Fiat and for Chryslers and for Mercedes and all that. And all they had was their little Trabis and these Watfords. And they were jealous. They were also jealous to see the luxury that people enjoyed in the West because they always pushed that in Western TV. I don't know how many of you have seen, uh, are old enough to have seen the uh, TV series Dallas. Some of you know Dallas. It showed the wonderful life of these oil barons in Texas. An awful lot of people in East Germany in the GDR, they figured that's how people live in the West. You know, and that's the way we want to live, just like those people in Dallas. And a lot of people believed it. In fact, in the hospital once I was treated by a nurse and uh, I saw that she had three little gems in her earlobe. So I, I wanted a little nicer treatment if I could, <laughs> less painful. I said, that looks very pretty. And it did look pretty. Uh, uh, and she thanked me. A week later in an elevator, I saw a young woman who also had three little gems in her ears. And I thought, gee, it seems to be becoming a fad. A week later, I looked at Dallas and I saw the main actress there also with three little, <laughs> ah, that's where it comes from. People watched Dallas and they thought that's what we want to, how we want to like. And of course, Dallas was only one symbol and lots of other things too. They saw this uh, flashier, commercial, but, but uh, attractive. There were no commercials on Western, uh, on GDR TV, no commercials at all, which I think was a very good thing. But it meant that they fell for the commercials from the West easier and dreamed of having all those wonderful things. There were many shortages in the GDR because the GDR had to import almost all its raw materials. It had, as I say, almost nothing except this rotten coal. It, and to get that, they had to export whatever they could. And they made some very good products, modern products, but the best of them went to the West, it was sold in the West to get money to buy the other things. This meant they didn't have money to buy an awful lot of modern fashionable stuff from the West. There was just some of it, but it went fast. What used to happen when you'd see two women would meet 
in the street and one would say to the other, oh, that's a nice coat you have. It must be from, the, you must have gotten it from the West, from some relative or some sending it from the West. No, no, the other said, I bought it here. Where, where did he get it? And she'd go racing off to try to get something like that, but usually was gone by then, by the time she got there, because they could never keep up with demand because people who paid nothing for medical, for educational costs, paid almost nothing for rent and, and for fare, car fare in the subway, the streetcar, the bus, and, and the train all remained the same rate as 1945, which meant that you went on the subway or the bus 20, 20 pfennigs. Today, it's 270 euros, which means 540 Westmarks, which were much more were valuable than Eastmarks. Uh, um, no, 500, 540. Uh, it, it's increased by several hundred percent, uh, which means that a lot of people can't afford to, to use the subway, uh, especially older people on pensions. Uh, in any case, they had all of these advantages, but they didn't have those desirable goods. The, the advantages like medical and educational they took for granted, but it meant they had lots of money in their pocket, more than you could, they could buy goods for. And this led to dis dissatisfaction and envy of all that, and they couldn't travel like in the West, uh, which made for, as I say, and since many people had relatives in the West, there was a, uh, and because the West was constantly trying to cause dissension and, dis and anger and disillusionment in the East, it meant that the top leaders were afraid of the GDR turning pro-Western, which meant that they, they, that was the reason for making the newspapers and so forth one-sided and for, um, in general, for this atmosphere of not, not speaking in public against the a government or the party. Uh, privately, people did. It's not like in many of these Stasi films show that everybody's afraid of everybody else. They weren't. People talk uh, amongst themselves very freely, but not in public. In a meeting, they figured if I, if I say something against the government, maybe I won't get a promotion, or maybe I won't get the better vacation spot at the beach, or maybe uh, I won't get as good a chance to go to visit my relatives in the West as others did. Uh, why? Why get in, in trouble? Keep my mouth shut in public. Privately, they talked very freely. The Stasi was really everywhere because they were really afraid of being taken over by the West, which is what happened. Uh, so that that was basically the reason for it. Um, but of course, when you have people in a police or a, something like state security, the tendency is for many people, many of them join out of patriotism and being anti-fascist. But of course, you also have a tendency to people who like to use the, the, exercise their power and muscle to go into police jobs and such jobs so that they could be unpleasant, very unpleasant in, in cases if they thought there's real opposition. All of these factors, but most of all the envy, the fact that you couldn't get oranges except at Christmas, that bananas were very rare, certain southern, southern imported fruits were rare, uh, fashionable goods were possible, but you had to do a lot of running and have luck, uh, led to the fact that in 1990, when the vote came, the only one party supported keeping the GDR. That was the party which later became the left party, the Linka, to which I belong they got only 16% of the population, about that proportion I mentioned who were always solid. Um, the others thought, now the world is opening for us. We'll be able to go anywhere and have anything. Without Westmark, everything will be possible. Only gradually did they learn that the Westmark is very nice, but you have to, have to get it somehow. It's, it, it doesn't trickle from trees. And, the first thing that happened in 1990 to 1992, all of GDR industry was destroyed. When I say all, I'd say 80, 90 percent was their rivals in West Germany closed down the rivals in East Germany. The many 
uh, there were lots of de decrepit factories because the money in the East had been spent mostly on important industries, iron, the basic industry, agricultural machinery and the like. So that many factories had not been kept uh, really modern. They were wrecked, but also the modern ones were wrecked. They were divided up, sold in pieces, sold sometimes just for real estate value. Sometimes people bought them, took all the good machines out and sold them and let the rest go to hell. You had a absolute crisis, which has lasted to this day. Uh, certain areas they have finally over the years built up industrially a bit, like Leipzig, Dresden, a few big cities. But for large sections, you have whole towns and areas which may be dependent on one big textile factory. When that closed down, nobody had jobs and the people who served the workers had no jobs. They're desolate. An awful lot of the people left. Interestingly enough, mostly the, the, young, the girls and young women who felt they could take care of themselves if they went to the West looking for jobs, whereas a lot of the boys and young men preferred to stick to mama because they weren't used to running their own household. And therefore, there was a preponderance of, of young males in these deserted towns and villages, and or sometimes partially deserted, that varied. Sometimes it was half, but... And these are the ones who soon were picked up by the Nazi elements coming in from West Germany and some Nazi elements who'd been keeping their mouths shut but now came out of the woodwork and they went especially for this bunch of young people and people who were disillusioned when they found that that wonderful life that they had dreamed of was not so easy as, it, as they had thought. Uh, wages were lower in the East than in the West. Pensions were lower. Jobs, unemployment much higher than in the West and under worse conditions. And this led to a great deal of disillusionment and anger, which has turned to in various directions. Now to come to a conclusion, uh, there had been two, company, two parties which ruled Germany largely ever since it's, uh, the war. That was the Christian Democrats on the right, that's Angela Merkel, and the Social Democrats on the left, which are very much like the Democratic Party here. Talked very, talk, often talked very left, but was so close and was close to the big shots in the unions, but was always close to the, the finance forces. That means that they sometimes had to do things to keep their voters that would seem fairly liberal, but you could never count on them in a pinch. They were always ready to betray. And they, those two parties ruled pretty much all the years until recently. Soon, uh, in the recent years, four more uh, parties, have, well, three more have come up. There was always a third party which sort of decided which one rules. If it turned to the, yes, the Social Democrats or it turned to the Christian Democrats, it was the balancing. But three more parties were founded. First, the Greens, who are not like the Greens here. They were not a, they're not a left-wing party. They were originally. They're all for ecology, but ecology together with the big companies. And they're also, uh, they're good on some issues. They're good on women's rights. They're good on gay rights. They're not, they're against racism. They're for such things, but they're the worst of all in foreign policy. They're all out, hate Russia, hate Russia, move against, move, and they've supported every one of these wars up to now. So that the Greens are not like the Greens here. Then you had, AFD, Alternative for Germany, that's basically a fascist party. Most recent, it was born just a few years ago, but it immediately attracted all the little Nazi groups and small, tiny parties, which had never been important, pulled them together and quickly rose up to 92 seats in the, in the Bundestag from 700, which means it has a voice. And some of them try to look very respectable now, while others, working with them are the real thugs who march every weekend in some town or other in, in, in Germany like Nazis, just like Nazis. Past my home and once, it's really frightening. And now, as I, some of them try to look respectable, others are really come out with really fascist ideas. And they have not only grown on the national level, but they threatened to become the first party in two East German states in September. 
and this is dangerous. Uh, it gives them a big, big forward move. Uh, and this in a country, Germany, which as many people do not realize, is not only the strongest party, uh, the strongest country in Europe, but militarily is now building up a, 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 or wants to build up a European Union army in addition to NATO, dominated by West Germany, or by Germany rather. And these forces, their forces are building roads through, or, or improving, not building, but improving roads and rail lines through Germany from the North Atlantic coast where they can get weapons from the USA and their own straight towards Poland and towards the Russian border. And they're maneuvering right next to the Russian border in the north. So that, uh, although this, uh, it's an extremely dangerous situation, I wanna say that, which somehow people in the United States seem hardly aware of. Uh, finally, a word to the, the party I belong to, which is the Linke or the left, which was made up of the remains of the old ruling party in the east which pretty well fell apart with unification. A lot of people had been in only for, to, be a, to have a, a better job and, and to uh, improve themselves, not out of deep conviction or varying. But in 1990, it seemed as a disadvantage to be in that party. So most of the members left of the 2 million members, uh, so, uh, but some remained in which I belong. And later it joined West German leftists who were dissatisfied with their social Democrats or Greens and formed a new group there. And they joined together to form the left party, which faced several disadvantages. In the West, terrific anti-communism, such as you've known here, uh, anti-GDR communism was always a break so that until they formed, joined with the late left link or the left, they got maybe two, three percent. Then with this joining, it strengthened both sides and they moved up and up, gradually up and up to about 10, 11 percent, but didn't get beyond that. And unfortunately, it is now lowering down to eight and in the European election, only six percent. The reasons I see are that partially the left party is divided. There are parts, people in it who prefer who think so much of joining with the Greens and the Social Democrats and getting in governments that they don't realize or don't want to realize that for many people who are disillusioned, they say they're part of the establishment too. Why should we vote for them? They're no different. Also, because uh, Many of, uh, well, they have not really sufficiently fought in the streets, in the factories, in the schools. They've been concentrating to it great, too much on the, par the Bundestag in the parliament in, or, or the, in each state and have not really been able to uh, answer this disillusionment, which you have, especially in East Germany, where they have turned to, too far too much to this right wing party or to the Greens who seem different at least. I th there's one hope, and without our close, there's one hope, there's a terrific anger in all of Germany among many, many millions of people that rents have been up and up and up and up. And as I said, many more live in rented apartments than here. Rents have been going up. Big companies have taken over owning in Berlin one company which is related to Blackwell here, has 100,000 apartments. And what they do is they repair something, improve something, and raise the rent three times, pushing out mostly elderly people who've been there 20, 30 years and have no place to go, except way out in the sticks maybe, and even then it's not easy. And they're really desperate. And everybody's worried, either their rent has gone up or they're afraid it's going to go up, and this has gotten people so angry that at a rally several months ago, 40,000 in Berlin showed up. There were rallies all around the country, but in Berlin there were 40,000. And the left party, the Linke, has adopted, luckily for me, the a slogan which has emerged in this fight <clears throat> against the worst of these companies, called Deutsche Wohnen, German Living, 
to confiscate German living. This is a really socialist slogan in a way. And it caught on whether it continues to have an effect and how well the left party fights for it down below, not up above, also up above in the parliament, but down below among the people will help determine whether the left party moves ahead. And I should mention there are various differing ideas within the left party, which has various groups. It allows various like fractions of, of uh, there's one rather right wing, not right wing, but more direction social democrat. There's one for Cuba support, supporting Cuba. There's one for Christian group. There's a gay group. There's a trade union group. There's a, a small enterprises for shopkeepers <laughs> and stuff. And there's one, the communist front, a uh, communist platform to which I belong and which tries to work with also with left-wingers and communists who are not in the party to try to get fighting going and to tell people not to forget, whether they're in the Linker party or not, that we have to fight for improvement in, re in rent, social questions, because they've been getting worse since unification. Those advantages I speak have been cutting, cutting, cutting but not to forget a final goal, which is I see it, and I think you see it, to get rid of these big monopolies altogether, to have only people get money from their work that they've done and not from other people's work. This is the big goal. And not everybody remembers this goal every day, but it, it, I think it's false for some revolutionaries to call out practically the revolution tomorrow. That's stupid and often damaging because the media loves that. But not to forget the main goal, the future goal, that's the key question, I think, in the United States and in Germany and everywhere. And I'll close with that. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Becky. Now it's time for folks to ask questions or you know, discussion. Uh, back there first. Yeah, and what can you attribute the uh, rise of the AFD? Well, I, cr I try to say a lot of people are simply disillusioned and are fearful about their own future and the future of their children. And there's another main reason which I didn't mention. They have succeeded thanks to the media who had, at first said, we, we, don't, we don't like these fascists and we don't like racism. But since 19, uh, 2015, when almost a million people, refugees and uh, uh, people came to Germany, they've turned the hatred of the people who are disillusioned and angry, instead of against the people up on top, the people below them. In other words, these poor people who are coming in from war and from economic disaster in the South. And they've been able to direct the hatred, just as here against the uh, Central Americans or Mexicans, they've directed against these immigrants and refugees and saying they're to blame if we have things tough. They're getting all the money, which is of course a lie, as just as it is here. Uh, and they've used this hatred and the media have, every time there's some kind of a crime involving, and if you have a million people, an awful lot of them young men without families and without a trade and often without jobs, you have crimes. And, uh, but of course you have crimes among the German people too, but they build up these of the, in, uh, of the immigrants, foreigners, the foreigners against the foreigners, they build that up and play it over and over and over until they get a certain part of the population, the same time that here at, at, at uh, Charlottesville and so forth. They, they get them full of hate, and that's the kind of support this party, uh, including not only the worst hateful kind, but the kinds who may not go out on the streets hitting foreigners, but who say, they're to blame, they're to blame. They're getting everything instead of us. And we don't know what's coming and it's their fault. And that's where they get their, their support. Were the immigrants uh, taking jobs from, uh, from the Germans? No, they're not taking jobs from them. No? It's very slowly, a certain number are being integrated and getting apprenticeship and jobs, but they're not taking jobs away. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna call on people online too. Just one little privilege of adding to what Victor said that, you know, the AFD doesn't reach people with swastikas. And when I was in Berlin during the last election, they had these 
beautiful posters with a uh, a lovely uh, young blonde woman lying in a, a green meadow with flowers around her, and she was pregnant. And you can see from the poster, and, and it said, you know, Angela, a lot of the people who had supported the immigrants said these are new Germans, and the poster just simply said, you know, we don't need uh, new Germans; we can make our own. And uh, you know, it was little subtle emotional kinds of messages and posters like that that were. That they, that they use online. Can we take one of those people? Yes. And then we'll go to Barbara. We'll start with Lowell Denny. Um, Lowell. Hold on. Lowell, your mic is open. Uh, aloha, Victor. Um, this is Lowell um, from Hawaii. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, the question I have, I just got your book. Um, about a year ago, I got Margot Honecker's memoir that she wrote with Louis Corvalon, the former head of the Chilean Communist Party. And I'm wondering if you've read that book and what your thoughts about it are, if you have read it and connected with all that, what other books can you recommend besides yours and perhaps Margot Honecker's can you recommend us to read about East Germany? Thank you. I'm afraid I have not read the book. Uh, I've followed her story as well as I could, but I have not read the book. Uh, Margaret Honecker was the Minister of Education while her husband was the head of the party for years. Uh, I can only say this, that she in her thoughts after uh, 1990 and reunification, where her husband was put in jail, uh, had a rough, very rough time and she remained very true to her principles, but she was not loved in the GDR because she tended to be very dogmatic. Uh, looking at her, uh, at her husband was not particularly uh, favored either. It, making, helping to, I, say, I would say, helping to cause people to turn away from the GDR at the same time, not realizing these people that even though we could have wished for much more rapport and, and, and uh, understanding of the people and their problems and frank discussion of it, which lacked, uh, which was lacking and led to the downfall, at the same time, people like me could not forget that people like Eric Honecker, her husband, and she too, had been from the very start and before the GDR had been active anti-fascists and remained true to this anti-fascist position and to the goal of socialism. So that even while we wish that they could have done it much, much better talking with people, and in her case, in the school teaching kids, uh, still we, we could only see them as people who are also fighting for the same goals we were. This was a complicated business which uh, is still discussed today. Okay, let's hear from Barbara, then we'll go back to somebody, back and forth from here and then online. Thank you, Victor. Um, since I work for the People's World, I've read a number of your articles over the years. Um, I really appreciated what you had to say very much. And as you were speaking, I kept thinking, this reminds me of what's going on here. This sounds like what's happening here. Uh, one thing I wondered about was um, union membership and the direction that union membership is taking. I don't think you uh, spoke about that, but uh, that is a concern here. And um, I didn't know whether how how organized the uh, the workers are in uh, in Germany today and what the trend is and if some of the major unions are having organizing drives. And it, I don't need to, you don't need to speak at length about it, but I'm just curious about that. And once again, thank you so much for your- Thank you. The unions are uh, various conflicts. You can't completely generalize. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, uh, they are only industrial unions. And some of them, at least two of them, well, one of them especially, veers rather towards the left. It's the one of people working for the government, for government services. It includes everything from garbage collectors, kindergarten teachers, 
in many, many other fields in, in government. Uh, and its leadership has never been too close to the Letha. They tend sometimes be for the Greens where they can, but, uh, but without associating themselves with one party, they are a fighting party. And they are, uh, and not party, I mean union, mm -hmm. fighting union, most of all. Second, the largest union is the metal workers, which includes all machine and everything else. They, their youth movement is pretty far to the left. The leadership is uh, not mixed, partly, you would say, in a way, corrupt, because especially in the auto industry, the auto workers, which is the main export industry, they are privileged in a way. They have, they have managed to get somewhat better position and secure a position, and for that, they are not so, so militant. In fact, now, to a certain degree, newer workers, including some of the immigrants, have been got, given jobs there, but at a lower rate. The, the old attempt to split, you know, with two tiers, two, two uh, levels. And so, uh, one union, it's the miners and chemical workers, are very conservative, they're to the right. So you ha and the teachers union is the furthest left, interestingly, uh, but not the most powerful. So then you have differences and quals, almost none of them dare to really support the Lincoln party because that would mean anti-communist uh, uh, accusations. So they're careful, but on a lower level, they sometimes work with the left party and the left party supports them in some of their fights they have not been extremely active over the years in strike, but it's beginning to grow. And they've had a few big strikes. One interesting one was the kindergarten teachers. This, this, uh, no, it wasn't the teachers union. It was the this national service, and this got support from the left party and was very popular in the country, even though it meant hardships for parents. A, a, another one which was very popular in Berlin, at the biggest hospital in Berlin, it's called Charité Hospital where the, not the doctors or nurses, but the staff struck for, for decent pay and got very good support from the left, which sometimes does very good jobs. It's just not wide enough for my, uh, in my eyes, but did do things. So that the unions are really torn between support for the Social Democratic Party, which they always used to have, but the Social Democratic Party has betrayed them over and over and over. So that that's why it's lost till it's now from up above 30%, which it used to have, more or less like the Christian Democrats, it's now down to 15%. It's lost half its support. And they're trying to think of ways to win it back and to sound more left wing. We'll see what happens. Okay, uh, should we take one other online? Yeah, oh, oh sorry, they don't come. Uh, uh, that was Barbara, so online, then we'll come over here. Okay, Stuart Banner. Uh, Stuart, your mic is open. Uh, hello, can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I'm a high schooler in uh, Kansas, and uh, I've been uh, seeing how um, the youth in America, like all around this country, are really, um, I guess you can say, uh, um, not really happy with the current state of things. And there's a lot of this energy and a lot of this, like, anger. And I was wondering about the... Um, like the best way to capitalize on that. On the anger in, in Germany? Like, like the youth, like, um, yeah. uh, the, like against capitalism, you know, it's um, a lot of um, I like see. my friends my age have like, like a lot of my friends in high school uh, live in their own apartments now. They have higher rent and um, their jobs. A lot of my friends, we live in Kansas, which has one of the lowest, um, what's it called, uh, minimum wages, and you... First of all, I generally try to avoid m making my opinion about United States politics, because after all, I live in Berlin. At the same time, I should say that progressive people that I know in Berlin, including Americans who live there also, uh, had great hopes at some of the events in the United States, the fact, for example, that one very important and interesting candidate or has come, has done away with a 
terrible taboo on the word socialism. Uh, we have supported him, I, I could, you know who I mean, who came out and spoke for socialism, even though he's, his meaning of the word socialism might be somewhat different from mine or one others, but nevertheless, he's opened the discussion on the question of socialism. And I, th I would say, if I were to make a judgment, that the important thing in the United States, as in Germany, is that the varying groups who are fighting for their own uh, needs, whether that is women's questions, Black Lives Matter, gay lives, Mexican, Mexican or Latin people, or people for uh, environment, that they keep on fighting for those things, and especially the unions, fighting for their rights and, and defending themselves against more attacks. The best example, as far as I know, is in uh, the, the teachers, and especially we've admired the teachers of Chicago, but not only, or, or West Virginia, and also Oklahoma. These are things which make us hopeful that, but if all of the different groups fighting for their rights should continue, but should combine their efforts, and never forgetting for what I think is the most important of all, the fight against the danger of war, of more and more and more billions going to armaments and into confronting Russia as if it's a great foe and adversary that has to be conquered, to oppose every effort in that uh, sphere, the maneuvers which are going on, on, right on the Russian border with German and American troops joining there to, really to, uh, as a threat. I think that if these groups can get together here, but also in Germany, the groups fighting for rent reform the, uh, and so forth, if they can get together and move together, they can really have an important effect and perhaps bring both countries, which are two of the most powerful in the world, forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, over here, Shelby. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is something that, that I ponder about. With all the external forces coming down on the GDR, if I understand what you're saying correctly, you think that the German government was still too rigid? In, the GDR in, government? Yeah, yes. still too rigid. And uh, so I guess my question is, uh, How could they have been less rigid? And do you think that would have saved the GDR? That's, that's one, and I want that mostly. And then second, just quickly, uh, is, is the link of, is the membership becoming younger in age? First to the second question, evidently, especially in West Germany, there are more and more young people joining. Uh, or there were in the last year or two. At present, I don't know because there has been a drop in recent, uh, at least in the votes. I don't know about the membership, but in, in the last two, three years, there was an encouraging growth because a lot of the membership of the Linke Party in East Germany were, had been in the old socialist unit, the party that ruled the GDR, and are still the old faithful, but oh, they're, they're getting very old and dying out. So that that was a reason for the decrease in, in votes and in membership. But there seems to me, especially uh, in the last two years, a growth in young people, some very enthusiastic. The important thing is, is to involve them in battles and fights for their uh, rights. That's the way to keep them and hold them. And that's still not always learned so well. And that leads me to the first question. The, uh, the GDR leadership never really learned to speak to the people, partly because of their, of their past. They grew up, almost all of the top leaders, in the fight against the Nazis. They suffered terribly in it. The whole, uh, if you look at the members of the Politburo, which ruled the country basically from start to finish, uh, first of all, they were getting old, and, uh, and therefore not, uh, that's also a handy, it doesn't have to be a handicap, when I think of myself, of course, but, uh, <laughs> but um, that's a handicap there too, if you see my pain. <laughs> but uh, they had never properly learned 
to speak openly with the people about their problems for fear that this large percentage of the population was not exactly enthusiastic. They never really understood how to speak to these people to win them. There were, uh, plus you get an awful lot of bureaucrats and people who, who just out for their job and uh, in, in any government, but here too, who were not so much interested in furthering the cause of socialism, they were interested in their careers and so forth that could be difficult. And from the top, they never, uh, I feel, they never really learned how to speak to the people openly about the problems and to involve them. So that there was a not, as there should have been, a feeling of the working class, these are our factories. They were their factories because the, the work they did, the, the, what was earned from it, what would be profits in another country, went into paying for education and health and all these other things. But they did not often have that feeling that it's my factory. And therefore, they gave these factories up much too easily when the 1990 came and suddenly found they were gone, including their jobs. This was a shock, um, a terrible shock for some. Uh, some learned the proper lesson, but not enough. But we wish all the time that the leaders, that in their speeches, they could make good speeches with humor and with liveliness. Instead, you got the same old line over and over and over, so nobody could listen to it. And the same was true in much of the newspapers. You had people, good people, clever people, who, who did good magazines and good TV programs and such, uh, which were really, some of them wonderful. Our theater was the best in Europe and our opera was the best in Europe. People who, are, but also progressive, like especially around Bertolt Brecht and others, who's quoted here as I see in such signs someplace. But in the official newspapers, and that was the main ones and news, it was really, it turned people off, not on. And uh, in cliches, in the same old line, also black and white in the political sense, in other words, everything in the West is bad, everything in the East is good, and people could see the things in the West were not all bad. <laughs> First of all, they had uh, a higher living standard. Nobody could catch up with this Western, which was one of the best in the world. But uh, the GDR had a very high living standard, but never could catch up with the Western one. Um, instead of talking about that and discussing it, it was rather not mentioned. And this even in the schools. And this led to a lack of a rapport of understanding between those up above and down below. This is what we mourn all the time. It was all like caring. I have, for God's sakes, can't we learn to talk to the people properly? And, and they didn't. Uh, at the same time, I couldn't be against these people who had spent years in prison or in the underground who were really for socialism and against fascism. But at the same time, you said, can't they learn that? Can't they learn that? And they never did. And in the last year before the, in the downfall, this final year, uh, Hanukkah became very ill. There was a weakness in the leadership. Nobody quite was up to replace him. And he was not, he was never learned. He, he never made a, a speech that I heard that was any worth listening to. It was always correct, but not interesting. Uh, we have some leaders like that now. Perhaps they'll help the left. We'll see. Okay. Uh, there was. Uh, is there anybody else left online? Yes, Gary Miller. Okay, and then uh, then it's me. Yeah. Gary, your microphone is open. Thank you, um, Victor. I am so enjoying your book. It's wonderful. Um, I have a, a question. You were saying that the, basically the majority uh, in East Germany were wishy-washy when it came to the, the politics. Did the Berlin Wall and the propaganda about it and the facts about it play a part in that? The Berlin Wall, uh, I didn't quite catch the, uh, were they a part of it? Well, I'll talk about the Berlin Wall. Let it go at that. The Berlin Wall, was a, a very unfortunate thing in every, in, in almost every way. The, the exception of a few people like me, for me, as a, as a, def a defector, as a, a, um, from the army, 
I was always a little afraid when Berlin was open. You, you, there was no, no, you could walk right across. I was always a little afraid that maybe the United States Army would come after me. With the wall, of course, I was safer. I was the only one who had it better. Uh, but for many people, it was very hard, especially the Berliners, because 60,000 East Berliners used to work almost daily in West Berlin, getting Western wages in Western money, which was more than they could ever make in the East. Not only that there was corruption all back and forth, and worst of all, there was a terrible, terrible brain drain. In the West, they would say, communicate to medical students or engineering students or skilled machinists. They would tell them, don't come over to us now. This is before the war. Don't come over to us now. Wait, wait till you finish your GDR education till you're already a, a doctor, a skilled machinist, or an engineer. Then when you have that, you come over to us and we'll give you a job in those old big companies that are left at much higher wages than you'll get in the GDR, and you'll be able to travel and maybe buy a Mercedes or a BMW. But wait till you let them pay it for your education. This, also the doctors. Uh, there was a big drain on doctors. For the same way, a doctor in the GDR got a much higher pay than most workers, but nothing like what a doctor in West Germany became. So got so that this brain drain, which was especially rapid in 1961 for various reasons, political and uh, economic, uh, meant such a brain drain that the whole existence of the GDR was threatened. That with this loss, there could be uh, up, uh, difficulties that could lead to the takeover. And this is why, in basically in self-preservation, this wall was built, which in terms of propaganda was a terrible disaster for the GDR, which became a terrible, the, the, the Berlin Wall was all they knew about the GDR, that and Stasi. And, uh, and yet it was necessary, and of course they felt if we, if we let a few mouse holes where people can get through, then it could become a stream. We have to close it up completely. And this was propagandistically very, very tough and very rough. Although I would recall that when you have walls built in other parts of the world, either in Palestine or in the Mexican border, nobody seemed, well, some people do get excited about, but a lot of people accept that but the Berlin Wall was impossible. It, but it was, it was very unpleasant. And of course, when it went down in 1989, people did rejoice, uh, except for me. <laughs> it would change for me, not for the, and I had no gain from it. But most people rejoiced, and I could understand their rejoicing that they could visit their family whenever they wanted and travel. Hey, yes, it's your turn. In the early 1980s, I had some neighbors of mine who were from El Salvador. And as far as they knew, GDR was helping with training of liberation forces. I don't know if that's true. Can you talk to, about how the GDR supported liberation movements around the world? Yes, it certainly did. I don't know about El Salvador specifically, but I know that for example, in Nicaragua, uh, when it was uh, under progressive leadership, they set up a clinic with the best German doctors and nurses and Nicaraguans then for everybody, uh, everybody free of charge, which was so good that, that some of my ha uh, Harvard classmate of mine, who was a, a research scientist, was full of uh, wonder and amazement at how wonderfully they had set this up. But not only that, they supported in many ways the freedom movements, especially in Southern Africa, all around Southern Africa, with in many ways, not with weapons, but with help and advice, and, uh, and also in, in terms of helping their exile movements, as in the South African case, where the GDR published the, the uh, regular magazine of the ANC in exile. They helped in Chile, supported Allende as long as he was in power. When Allende was thrown out by Pinochet, the GDR embassy helped sneak out people and save them through the embassy, uh, get them out. And it also had air um, radio bulletins, uh, 
regular radio bulletins to Chile from anti Pinochet Ch Chileans who were in exile in the GDR, supporting the underground there. They did the same in other, in other cases. They supported uh, in Vietnam the rebuilding of villages which were smashed by uh, uh, American bombers. And uh, in, in Algeria, they supported the French, the, uh, the uh, Algerians, in achieving independence. Wherever there was such a fight, they supported it in any way they could. This was a really a dramatic thing. And I might add, in, in some cases in the United States, the most famous is Angela Davis, when this black American fighter and communist she was, was uh, threatened with a death sentence. There was a giant campaign in the GDR among young people and children to help Angela and send letters or postcards to Angela with the children with a rose off and a rose for Angela. And there were so many of them, they came in sacks and sacks and filled truckloads, literally, going to California to the court. The judge there didn't know what was happening. <laughs> he was so amazed where all these trucks full, trucks full of, of letters were coming. The same was done in the case of the Winston 10, which was somewhat later, not so famous, a similar case, but also with, uh, with other cases where people were uh, threatened, uh, there was a solidarity campaign. Okay, uh, Harold. I, I, I have, have one question. question. How did the separation of Berlin into the parts uh, of West versus East, how did that impact East Germany as a whole? Wait, I didn't, I didn't, the, the, the fact that West Berlin, that Berlin was right in the middle yes, of uh, East Germany, yes. and how did that impact the the whole of the whole of East Germany? Just by that being right there in the center of, uh, of extremely, extremely. I don't know if you all know it, but you know Berlin was Berlin was in the middle of of the GDR. But, and West Berlin, therefore, was a Western island in the middle of the East uh, of, 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 of the GDR. And everything was thrown into West Berlin by the United States and West German government and others to make it look very prosperous, to make it very prosperous, relatively. To, they had special tax exemptions for factories, uh, for uh, countries, companies which moved there. They had special programs to build up new homes and buildings. Uh, and they filled the shops with wonderful things. Uh, and since until 1961, the East Berliners could go over there whenever they wanted. They not only went over there to buy things which were unavailable in the East, uh, but they went over there to the, see the Western movies. Although you could see a lot of American movies in East Berlin, but not always the ones you wanted. They go over there for the theater or for, or for dances, which were open all night. Uh, <coughs> It was a constant, constant attempt to show people how wonderful the West is. And most important, however, was the fact that these 60,000, it was, at one point anyway, went over. And what they did was a, a lot of the more unskilled people, house, house domestic workers, for example, but also construction workers and others, they'd go over, they'd work at less than the union wage in the West. In, uh, say a house uh, uh, per cleaner cleaning woman would get 200 instead of the 250 that a Western woman would get, but she turned that 200. She'd go to a money changer in West Berlin for 200 West marks. She'd get uh, 800 or a thousand East marks. So, which meant when she went back to East Berlin, she was getting more than a, a trained engineer. Not only that, she'd buy cheap. East German cheaply, she'd buy a sausage or a, a dozen eggs or some butter, and she'd smuggle it under her clothing in the subway or the uh, elevated over to West Berlin, sell it at under the price there, but turn that into this money, and she'd be get lots more, she could do it again. And sometimes she'd tell her employer how terrible things are in East Berlin, we're suffering, she'd say, well, you take this pack of cigarettes or maybe a carton of cigarettes, which she'd sell then in East Berlin for, for, for a big high price. One such case was after the war went up, for, uh, for several years, I think about three or four years, it was impossible for West Berliners to come to East Berlin. 
They were negotiating all the time. West Germans and foreigners could up to a, a certain uh, to midnight, but he, West Berliners couldn't. When that finally was possible, the West Berliners could visit their relatives in East Berlin also only till midnight. You know what happened? Uh, this became a big joke, but it was true. Do many, many East Berliners would say to their neighbors, I'm expecting my aunt or my cousin or my brother-in-law or something tomorrow. Can I hide my, my Frigidaire in your apartment? <laughs> or can I hide my you know, some modern equipment in your apartment so that they don't think we're doing too well and they bring us more the next time? <laughs> this was a, a joke, but it was true. They were doing it because they were living comfortably in the East. It's only that there were certain things they couldn't get. One of the funniest I'll tell you about, uh, people from all over East Germany, if they visited West uh, East Berlin before the war, they'd go uh, across to West Berlin, which they weren't supposed to, and they'd change their East money to West at a terrific loss, which was therefore illegal, but enough money to buy things that they wanted that, uh, that they couldn't get in the East. One of the things was Nescafe, for example, and certain also there was a fad for petticoat dresses for girls and things like that, which you couldn't get in the East. They buy them. One of the things they bought was very funny because I saw there was a customs control to check on that. Mostly the customs, two men would walk, walk through, the, through the cars checking and they knew that people did that. So they didn't usually bother people if they bought some few things, but they had an eye for people who were smuggling important things back or forth like GDR, high value porcelain or toys or cameras going west, but going east, the, if somebody was seeming to do it on a business basis, but there was one thing people bought because they weren't made yet in the GDR, which they couldn't hide. I looked out the window of a train and saw about six people holding out, holding their hands out the window, holding hula hoops. Because <laughs> he can't fit, he can't squeeze a hula hoop into a valise or a suitcase, you know. <laughs> so out the, the customs people knew about it and they didn't do anything. To, but it looked so funny to see five or six hula hoops hanging out the window. I have a follow-up on that. What about people coming from the west to the east to buy cheap goods yes. and, and yes. Uh, that way uh, causing so shortages mm -hmm. in uh in yes. Well, it's interesting too. It's true that people from the East went to the West to get products they couldn't get, but people from the West came to East Berlin to buy products very, very cheaply, especially because they had this very good currency exchange rate. So it was like that. But this got so bad that in the early 1950s already, I think about 52, 53, the GDR stopped that to buy food and clothing you have to show your ID that you are an Easterner, not a Westerner. So that even to get a even to get a sausage in the street or an ice cream cone, you have to dig in and show your ID, which is a pain in the neck. But I think most East Berliners were glad to see it because it meant that the, the others wouldn't weren't buying everything out at, at dirt cheap prices and cleaning the shelves. However, certain things were exempted from this. You right. did not have to show ID, and these were. Uh, books, records, theater tickets, and also hairdressers and physical therapists like that, which meant that all along the border, West Berlin, East Berlin, you have people, Westerners coming to the hairdressers for a, for a hairdo and paying in West money or with some West cigarettes, which were always desirable, and therefore getting a prefer, pre pre preferential treatment, uh, angering, the East Germans, of course, and it also meant that our theaters, which are so very good, were often filled with Westerners, the, the good things, the interesting film of uh, opera and film and so forth, uh, not film, not film, but opera and theater, because they get in by changing them when they get in for the cost of a co co coffee and a piece of cake, they get the best opera tickets. And this was a terrible drain, but especially on, on labor power. 60,000 people going across every day for these jobs were lacking in the East. And that, of course, was stopped by the wall. With the wall, all of this was stopped immediately. And uh, that was another reason for the wall. 
Yeah, you'd always see American soldiers there spending the weekend in East Berlin. Uh, I saw that plenty of times, having a great time. You know, ten cent beers. Not stuff. the weekend, but the day. I mean the day. Yeah, the, the day. day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, one <laughs> online, and then Scott. Is that okay? Yeah. Online. Oh, there's no one. Okay, Scott. Go ahead. Yeah. I, well, I was just going to say on that. I mean, I remember it was one time when I was in the GDR. I can't remember. Louder, please. I was in the GDR, and I can't remember exactly what the it was before the wall, and I remember um, I was um, in, a, in, a, in a department store, and all of these GIs were coming in to buy stuff in there, you know, and so I walked up to them, and I said, how come, how come you guys get to come here and buy stuff? He said, oh, because for, for, for GIs, we're allowed in any sector. We can go, we're, we're, we're with the occupation, I guess they call it. And we can go any place we want to go. And I said, well, well, why would you come here to buy stuff? He said, it's cheaper than the than the PX over in in in, uh, in West Germany to come here and buy clothes and to buy all kinds of stuff like that. It, I remember just it's true. And I'll tell you one funny thing that happened to me. You saw while you were reading in in the United States newspapers as as if it was something terrible, uh, risky to go into East Berlin. I read articles which, as if it was. So, you know, so terrible, you'd have to go like this. You, you see GIs there all the time. Uh, they go on day visits. They come with buses, and they, then they can walk around all they want and buy all they want, and they bought lots of special things like souvenirs and so forth, very, very cheaply, and tapestries and all kinds of things. Once I heard two or three of them talking and, and laughing, and I was curious. And of course, I didn't want to betray that I was an American, but I wanted to listen to what they were talking. I didn't hear much, but one thing I did catch, evidently they thought these were Russians. Well, the people were Russians. <laughs> they, they were so confused about the politics that they thought that the East Germany's Russian zone, they called it, so it must be Russians. <laughs> but I'll also say this, I, I remember, and I can show anyone a picture of it. We had a, uh, an annual, Solidarity Day in East Berlin. A big, big central square. Thousands came, often to buy souvenirs from foreign countries and so forth, buy newspapers. All the newspapers had stands, but we also had solidarity stands. One of them was for the Wilmington Tent. There's nine black guys in Wilmington, North Carolina, and one white woman. And we had a stand collecting signatures. And uh, there was a crowd listening. I talked. I spoke about it. And a bunch of GIs came along, and it was what was interesting was, first of all, they were a mixed group, black and white. Perhaps it's that was conscious policy, I don't know, to send in groups like that. But interesting was, they, they asked what we were doing, and I explained what the Wilmington case was, and found that the three black guys knew immediately what the story was. The three white guys had never heard of it. It was a sharp difference, but all, all of them signed including the white guys, even though that was televised in GDR television. Uh, they were at risk, they risked it, or they didn't worry about it, and all signed. I have a couple of photos of that here. Scott. One other thing. Um, Go ahead, Scott. Uh, another irony that, that uh, I, I wonder uh, if you notice in Chicago is that um, if you go if you go downtown Chicago and you see all of these big glass buildings with all of this light and they have internal gardens and all of these things to make them very livable. The real irony is, is that most of the, the original designs were from GDR architects who were building working class homes and they wanted to, and they were thinking about the health of people and they thought about, um, they, you know, they thought about how light affects people about all these different kind of things and those ideas came to be corporate america all over the place when they build these huge apartment complexes and stuff like that they build them based on these original designs that were started by the architects so i must say that I, I, that's new to me i never heard that american architects learned from the gdr oh in Chicago, that's new. yeah uh, I, I'd like to find out more about it. It is true that in these big housing projects, uh, which were often ridiculed in the West, they were called 
uh, uh, worker silos right. uh, because they were 10 and 13 story high buildings. And of course, when they were first built, they were construction sites. It wasn't very nice, but before long, when they had the shrubbery and trees and grass and playgrounds and everything, they were really very nice. Uh, and this is one of the things, however, which helped to break the GDR because Eric Honecker, when he became the head of the party, promised partly to, to build up confidence. He promised by 1990, every family will have a, a decent modern apartment. In other words, with central heating and sanitary, everything, which was not the case in the old days. Uh, and there was a giant program of building houses, but always, as you say, with kindergartens and schools and uh, usually a clinic if it was big enough and and grass and green and, and, and playground and so forth. Uh, this was true all over. Sometimes the architectural design was very nice. Often it was simple and prefab panels usually, but it was necessary to make housing for the people. They never accomplished this goal and the GDR came to an end, but I think they built close to 2 million of these new apartments which in a country of 16 uh, plus million people, two million times, say three, averaging three in an apartment is a good many, mm -hmm. since many had already been built. So that it was quite, an, quite but cost billions. And this is one of the things which, which uh, led the economy along with military defense, because West Germany was building up its army to the most modern extent and uh, the problem that electronics were necessary in modern machine building and, and electronics was something the GDR did hardly had any of and couldn't get from the West or the East and had as a little country to try to compete with IBM and Sony. This cost billions. They could never catch up, but they had to keep trying. Those are things which helped to break the GDR, uh, so, but uh, financially and put them in debt, which was finally pretty tough and rough, the debt. And yet those social questions I've met, the, the cheap rents and so forth, they stayed, and the medical care stayed till the end. I had a question though, I actually had a question. Yeah, go ahead, go, go ahead. ahead. We have an online question. Oh, online question. Not a, yeah. Scott, let, let, actually, let, we have two. All right, well, let, 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 take one of those and then you. Is that the right? first one is from Chris Griffin. What do you think is the best way currently to fight the rise of the far right ideology we are seeing today in places like Europe, America, and Brazil? And not an easy question. Uh, the only way I say is that all people with progressive goals could overcome their differences on, on relatively minor matters or on old quarrels which they once had and, and fought over, which however are often today pretty irrelevant or unimportant to overcome their differences and to join the various struggles which, they, which they're engaged in for their own rights to merge them into a political movement. I think eventually, well, whether in an established party but with no illusions, in other, uh, or in a new party, that depends on the country. It's different in every country. In Germany, I still think it must be necessary to maintain and to build the Linker Party. In the United States, it's more complicated. In Brazil, also. Perhaps to put together some of the left-wing parties in Brazil and to join together, if they can, to overcome the fascists. But the main, main way, as I see it, is for all progressives to join in really fighting for the rights of the people in all their problems and all, because the billionaires who are taking over the world step by step, ever fewer, but fewer and fewer are, are, are gathering the billions, hide, either hiding it away or spending it on yachts and, and huge high scrapers, skyscrapers to, to break their hold on it and, and fighting them with every means metal, and possible, which means with strikes, with demonstrations, with rallies, with petition campaigns, and always remembering that question, as I mentioned, the, uh, avoiding war, 
which will end all our problems in complete destruction, mm -hmm. but to join these different struggles in for similar goals for sometimes certain candidates, sometimes certain parties, but always remembering that the main power has to be not with individuals, but with the people organizing to fight for their own rights. Uh, right, I'm gonna take Scott's question, but and, and and I'll take you know one more after that, but I just want to remind everybody that it is ten minutes to nine. <laughs> At nine o'clock we've gone two hours. Yeah. We said we would go like half, half an hour over the webinar time, mm -hmm. but we've kept the webinar going, I guess. But I just want to remind people that maybe we should try to wrap up by nine. So I got Scott and then I have CJ. Okay. okay. Um Scott. uh are you familiar with the Industrial without shock, Bernd Bau, Kumi Energy Union, and what kind of role does it play? And the reason I'm asking is that they are the main union in Germany linked with Industrial, which is a global uh, union federation that includes the steelworkers in the United States. Los Mineros in Mexico, includes unions all over the world, industrial unions who are fighting to have a uh, international uh, trade union federation. So I, I was wondering about what you know about their their yes. role. They, they must be very progressive. They're not. They're not. They're not. That's the union I mentioned, which is leans to the right, interestingly. Right. Chem uh, chemicals and mining is the I would think the furthest, except for the policemen's union, it's the furthest right among the, there are not very many uh, big industrial unions in Germany, maybe uh, around 10 or less. They're the furthest right, I'm afraid, except for the policemen's union. This does not mean that all of their members or all of their people are always to the right, but generally speaking, they're the ones which are almost always capitulating and uh, w with their bosses, uh, getting relatively good wages because they're the they're a group that has worn out pretty good positions in their preferences. So why but not you, militantly. Why do you think they would they would affiliate with that kind of order? That's order? interesting to me too and I don't know. Because it, it's extremely progressive. Uh, uh, one possibility is that this world organization is not so leftist or progressive. Oh it is. Really? It is. Then it puzzles me too frankly. Um, Perhaps there are elements in the union who are interested in international. Uh, that's possible that they believe in fighting together on a world scale. But just, just, in Germany, they do not play. A, they, they, among the unions, as I say, they're the furthest to the right. Just, just, just so you get an idea about industrial, their whole concept is in order to have global power against global corporations. The only way you're going to do it is to control. Is to Unionize the whole supply chain, not just um, not just the the industries that you were in. So, for example, the industrial helps to organize rubber workers in Africa for the first time into unions, so that they and it brought all kinds of uh, it gave them all kinds of uh, benefits that they did union benefits that they never had before. On the basis of the idea is that if you control the supply chain, then you have a way of controlling these global corporations. It's possible that I was uh, that I'm not completely correct in my judgment, That's what uh, and that would interest me greatly. And maybe there are elements in the union hawk, but I would be very cautious and 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 keep an eye because, as I say, their reputation in in, in Germany is a uh, conservative. That's good. All right, I'm going to take one more question. So, from and so let me say something before you end it. That I put out a bulletin every uh, every month. Uh, I hope I'll be able to continue it about German affairs in English, which I sent to anybody who wants it can take, get it. Some of you do by signing here your name and your email address, and you'll be. I'll put you on the list. I can pass this around or give it to every or leave, place it here. Uh, I hope I'll be able to continue as soon as I digest this.
big long okay. trip. I think. I'm going to take that last question from CJ and then those who want to purchase books and get them signed by, uh, by Victor. His book can do that after we finish with CJ. But don't start that yet, Barbara, please. Let's have CJ's question and Victor's answer. Okay. okay. My, my question very quickly is uh, often the GDR had the reputation of being the, the most financially or economically successful of the yes. Eastern European countries. And given that you probably traveled to many of them during your time there, did you find that to be true? And if so, what were the special factors about socialist system in East Germany uh, that made it more successful than some of the other countries? Yes, it was generally assumed by everybody that the GDR was the most, had the highest standard of living of all the Eastern European. Second was usually Czechoslovakia. Uh, it was well ahead of the Soviet Union, which caused problems because the Soviets said, why should we support them when, when they're doing better than we are? Uh, the reasons are various, varied. One is simply that Russia is such a giant company, a country which was so very backward up until 1917 and then had a civil war and then was destroyed by the Nazis to a huge degree. That's part of the, uh, uh, an important part of the uh, result. Another reason is because G Germany had this long tradition of apprenticeship training skilled workers. Then there was, uh, there, was uh, there are either rumors or prejudices that the German workers are very disciplined and are hardworking the Russians used to joke about the fact that the, that the Germans work, 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 uh, whereas the Russians took it a little more easy, uh, and, that, and that there were stages. Russia is, it was better in Poland than in Russia and better in the GDR than in Poland. Uh, as I say, Czechoslovakia also pretty high up in the list. Romania, Bulgaria, very low in the, in, in the standard of living, and Hungary, very. Uh, the, the GDR also had to be favored to a certain degree because it was in competition with West Germany all the time. And this forced it to, uh, to really enforce a lot of improvements and benefits. Uh, that was also an incentive. Uh, it had a much more bigger, uh, well, better developed industry when it started out, even though it was wrecked and, and hurt in so many ways. I think that all adds up. Okay, now we will have, uh, again, thank Victor for all the 